The morning of the revolt passed normally in Treblinka camp. Quote, the Germans and Ukrainians noticed nothing unusual. They did not feel they had to fear a paltry handful of men such as we, recall Carpenter Vienik. They bucked orders, and we obeyed as usual. Unquote. But a worry had started to develop among the resistors. Vienik was in Camp 3, and the leadership of no way of knowing the exact time of the revolt when the initial assault occurred in Camp 1. Vienik, because of his privileged position of being able to travel between the two camps without too much difficulty, decided to find out the information. Quote, My superior, Loeffler, was no longer there. He had been replaced by a new man whose name I did not know, said Vienik. We nicknamed him Brown Shirt. He was very kind to me. I walked up to him and asked him for some boards to be used to get over the fences. Boards were stored in camp number one, and he, not wanting to interrupt our work, went with some workers to get them. The boards were brought. I inspected them and measured them, and then said they weren't right for the job. Unquote. Vienik volunteered to take a few men and go and select the boards he needed himself. The capo gave him permission and accompanied the working party. Quote, and so I went to the storage shed with my superior, all the while shaking with excitement. I felt that unless I made the most of this opportunity, all would be lost. Unquote. The revolt had to be launched in daylight, as the combat teams could move around the camp under cover of their normal duties. It was also time that the main assault on the fences would be launched towards dusk, giving those who managed to get over the wire the cover of fading light. Vienik needed to pass the precise time to the team in Camp 3. Quote, Presently I found myself in Camp Number 1 and nervously looked around, appraising our chances. Three other men were with me. The storage shed was guarded by a Jew about 50 years of age, wearing spectacles. Because he was an inmate of Camp Number 1, I knew nothing about him. But he was a participant in the conspiracy. My three helpers engaged the German superior in a conversation to divert his attention, while I pretended to be selecting boards. I deliberately went away from the others, continuing to select boards. Suddenly, someone whispered in my ear, Today at 5.30pm. I turned around casually and saw the Jewish guard of the storage shed before me. He repeated these words and added, There will be a signal. Unquote. Wiernik was ecstatic at this news. Quote, in feverish haste, I collected whatever boards were nearest to me, told my comrades to pick them up, and started to walk, trembling with fear, lest I betray my emotions. Unquote. Back in Camp 3, Wiernik attended an emergency meeting of the Resistance Committee. Again, our committee met furtively, and the word was passed around, wrote Wiernik. I asked everyone to keep cool and remember their individual assignments. The younger ones among us were greatly agitated, as I looked at our group, I began to believe that we would really win. Unquote. In total, there were 850 Jews inside Treblinka II on the afternoon of the 2nd of August 1943. Quote, the revolt was to start at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, recalled one of its participants, Kalman Tiegmann, reporting a completely different time from that told to Wienik. This is likely confusion in retrospect, as the revolt was triggered earlier than planned by an unforeseen event. In Camp 3, the usual daily routine continued, though with some subtle changes made by the prisoners. Quote, Volunteers for the afternoon work shift were then selected, said Wiernik. We assigned the weaker and less capable men to the first shift, because it had no task to perform. The first afternoon shift returned from work at 3 p.m. The men we had picked then went to work, 30 in number. They were the bravest, the pluckiest and the strongest in the lot. Their task was to pave the way for the others to escape." Unquote. The Zonderkommando in Camp 3 always wore striped concentration camp uniforms so they could be identified as those Jews who worked with the dead. Quote, a penalty of 25 lashes was meted out for wearing any other clothing while doing this particular job, wrote Wiernik. On that day, however, the men wore their clothes under their overalls. Before escaping, they would have to get rid of the overalls, which would have given them away at once, unquote. Wiernik and his comrades spent the rest of the afternoon sitting inside their barracks, nervous tension pervading the air like some noxious gas. Quote, 
every few minutes someone would remark that the time was drawing near. Our emotions at that point defied description. We silently bade farewell to the spot where the ashes of our brethren were buried. Sorrow and suffering had bound us to Treblinka, but we were still alive and wanted to escape from this place where so many innocent victims had perished." Unquote. The Germans kept some teenage Jews around for doing odd jobs, such as polishing their boots. They actually worked inside the wooden hut in Camp 1 that housed the Camp Armory, located between the SS and Ukrainian quarters. The plan was for the teenagers to go into the store and remove some arms in sacks, and then place these sacks on refuse carts outside and take them away. Quote, they were to place the smaller items, hand grenades and pistols, in buckets, items which could be carried by hand. The arms were to be distributed in various places in the camp, such as the motor workshop, or in the heap of potatoes, on similar places." Unquote. The NCO in charge of the armory was the tall and massively built SS Unterschaffuhrer Max Moller. A former Hamburg policeman, he was pathologically suspicious and greatly feared by the prisoners. Because of his large build, the prisoners had nicknamed Moller the Americana. On the day of the revolt, a prisoner named Sadovitz told Moller that he was needed in the potato workers' team due to labour problems. Sadovitz left the barracks with Moller, who locked the door firmly behind him. Once the coast was clear, a small group of prisoners crept up to the armory and, using their duplicate key, quickly disappeared inside. Outside, several others under commando stood waiting with a handcart, giving the impression that they were on an assigned work detail. Inside the armory, the Jews managed to break the chains that secured the weapons, grabbing 20 to 25 Mauser 98K rifles, 20 stick grenades, and 12 Walter P38 pistols. Others speedily broke open large wooden ammunition crates and helped themselves to cardboard boxes full of bullets. Once their comrades had given the all clear, the weapons were passed through the window and the sacks hidden under genuine rubbish in the handcart before being taken off to the barracks where their fellow resistors were waiting nervously. The weapons were distributed among the Sonderkommandos and magazines filled. The time for action had arrived. There were insufficient firearms for everyone involved in the revolt, so the rest armed themselves with knives and hatchets, hoping to grab rifles and pistols off the guards that they killed during the attack. But then tragedy struck. SS Oberschaufuhrer Kurt Kuttner halted two men who were not where they were supposed to be. Immediately suspicious, Kuttner ordered the men to strip naked. A search of their clothing revealed hidden banknotes that the potential escapers planned to use once they were out of the camp. Kuttner's response to the discovery of this contraband was to begin savagely beating the prisoners in the hope that they would reveal where the money came from and for what purpose. Quote, A great commotion broke out, recalled Kalman Tiegmann. All the time people kept coming back and reporting that they were beating them, that they would certainly reveal information. Perhaps they had already done so. And if that was the case, there was nothing to lose. We should start right away." Unquote. One of the revolt leaders, now armed with a pistol, ran towards Kuttner and opened fire. It was 3.45pm and the Treblinka revolt had begun. With no chance of luring SS men to their deaths, the Jews instead opened fire on any that they could see and also set about causing as much damage to the camp as possible. Moving fast, two Jews managed to set fire to a large tank where the SS stored thousands of litres of petrol. The tank exploded, setting fire to part of the camp fence that was interlaced with dry tree branches and foliage. Commandant Franz Stangl came to his office window, drawn by the sounds of firing. Quote, Looking out of my window, I could see Jews on the other side of the inner fence. They must have jumped down from the roof of the SS billets, and they were shooting." Unquote. Stangl immediately responded to the emergency by placing a telephone call to the local SS security police, the Jews not yet having had time to cut the telephone wires. Quote, by the time I'd done that, our petrol station blew up, said Stangl. That too had been built just like a real service station, with flower beds around it. Unquote. 
A tall column of black smoke rose into the air above the camp, accompanied by the crump of exploding grenades and the rattle of small arms. Fire spread quickly as the Jews torched the hated camp. Quote, the next thing the whole ghetto camp was burning, and then Matiz, the German in charge of the Totenlager, arrived at a run and said that everything was burning up there too. Unquote. Camp 3, the death camp, was in an uproar. Due to France taking a party of SS to the Boog River for rest and relaxation, the number of guards inside Camp 3 amounted to only one German NCO and half a dozen Ukrainians. When the first gunshots had rung out in Camp 1, the Totenjuden were inside their barracks under guard. There could be no doubt that the revolt had begun when loud grenade detonations followed the pistol shots. But it began much earlier than Jenko Wiernik had been told it would. Grabbing their weapons, the Camp 3 combat groups immediately swung into action. One Ukrainian Travniki was killed within seconds, while another died outside the prisoner barracks, their Mauser rifles being turned on other SS by the prisoners. Lieutenant Block opened fire on the Camp 3 wooden guard tower in an attempt to suppress its machine gun. While the combat groups fought the SS, many others managed to climb over the fences behind the prisoners' barracks and run for the nearby forest. Bloch was killed, attempting to hit the machine gunner who was picking off dozens of escapers who were caught in the open. Once through a gate, the Camp 3's under-commando started to run for the forest several kilometres away. Quote, we ran across swamps, meadows and ditches, with bullets pursuing us fast and furious, said Wiernik. Every second counted. All that mattered was to reach the woods because the Germans would not want to follow us there. Unquote. The closest help that the SS could count upon was a guard detachment from Treblinka 1, which was dispatched very speedily in trucks and field cars towards the large column of black smoke rising from the ruptured fuel tank at Treblinka 2. These fresh SS hastily disembarked from their vehicles and took off after the fleeing Jews, gunning down any within range. Quote, Just as I thought I was safe, running straight ahead as fast as I could, I suddenly heard the command, Halt! Right behind me, said Wiernik. By then I was exhausted, but I ran faster just the same. The woods were just ahead of me, only a few leaps away. I strained all my willpower to keep going. The pursuer was gaining, and I could hear him running close behind me. Unquote. Wiernik was being pursued by an SS Travniki from Treblinka 1. Quote, then I heard a shot. In that same instant, I felt a sharp pain in my left shoulder. Wiernik turned and saw the Ukrainian pointing a pistol at him. But by his actions, Wiernik could tell that the weapon had jammed. Pulling a hatchet from his belt, Wiernik charged the SS man and buried the hatchet in the left side of his chest. The Ukrainian collapsed at Wiernik's feet. A few moments later, Wiernik made it into the trees. In Camp 1, hundreds of Zonder commandos charged the main gate and the fences, yelling and firing as they went, while others tried to pin the guards down with withering fire or hurled stick grenades into the SS quarters. But the Jews had only a very limited supply of grenades and ammunition, which was soon practically exhausted. The remaining 25 SS TV and 60 Travnikis were quick to react, the guards in the tall watchtowers opening fire with machine guns, the bullets scything down hundreds of desperate people. Dr. Leisha was one of those killed in the melee, but the sheer number of people carried many to the camp gate and threw it to freedom. Quote, I simply climbed over the fence, recalled Tiegmann at the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem in 1961. There had already been people who had escaped that way, and over the fence there were already blankets and boards, and we climbed over these. Unquote. Hundreds of bodies soon littered the camp, or hung limply from the barbed wire fences. Commandant Stangl's urgent calls for assistance meant that nearby SS police and Wehrmacht units were soon piling into trucks and field cars and heading for the camp. On the day of the revolt, there had been about 850 Jews in Treblinka too. About a hundred refused to attempt to escape and remained in the camp. Of the 750 Zonder commandos who took part in the uprising, about 200 managed to escape from the camp. The rest was slaughtered in the camp or its close environs, mostly mown down by machine guns. 
Another 100 were hunted down and killed by SS and police search teams in cars or on horseback after the SS imposed a five-kilometer cordon around the camp. The Polish Home Army was able to help some of the survivors, and ordinary Polish people took terrible risks to shelter and feed escapees. In the end, about 70 Treblinka II Zonderkommandos survived the war, or about one in ten of those who took part in the escape attempt. This may not sound very good odds, but it was still infinitely better than the zero percent chance of survival that they all faced if they had remained as prisoners of the SS. There were differing fates for the Germans who ran the camp. Many served at Sobibor after Treblinka was closed down, and most of the Aktion Reinhardt officers and men were later sent to northern Italy to operate against partisans. Of the more notorious SS men at Treblinka too, Kurt Franz worked after the war as a labourer and then a cook. Arrested in late 1959, the former deputy commandant was arraigned, along with many other German SS, at the Treblinka trials. Sentenced to life imprisonment, Franz was released for health reasons in 1993 and died in Germany in 1998, aged 84. SS Scharfuhrer Heinrich Mattes was sentenced to life imprisonment in 1965. Unterscharfuhrer Max Moller served in Italy after Treblinka and vanished after the war. SS Oberscharfuhrer Kuttner was arrested but died before he could face trial in 1964. Josef Hertreiter, who worked in the undressing barracks in Camp 2, was arrested in July 1946 for his part in the T4 euthanasia program. Released, he was re-arrested in 1951 and sentenced to life imprisonment for killing children in Treblinka too. Released due to illness in 1977, Herr Treiter died in November 1978. SS Unterscharfuhrer Franz Zuckermel, who handled incoming transports and the confiscation and collection of valuables, later served at Sobibor. After the war, he worked as a tailor in Bavaria until arrested in July 1963. He was sentenced to six years in 1965, but released in 1967. He died in 1979, aged 72. Treblinka II's first commandant, Dr. Emfried Ebel, joined the Wehrmacht in 1944, serving to the end of the war. After the war, he practiced medicine until arrested in January 1948. Ebel, 37, hanged himself to avoid trial. The commandant of Treblinka I, SS Sturmbannführer Theodor van Eupen, was killed by Polish partisans in an ambush in December 1944, aged 37. And as for the commandant of Treblinka II, SS Hauptsturmführer Franz Stangl, he managed to survive the war and disappear into hiding in South America. After much searching by Nazi hunters, Stangl was identified in Brazil, where he was working for Volkswagen. He was arrested in 1967 and extradited to West Germany. In 1970, he was found guilty of the murders of one million people at Zobibor and Treblinka and sentenced to life imprisonment. He died of heart failure only six months later. Many thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share and also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.